This week in IT Sparkcast, Deep Fusion goes public through the back door. Broadcom and OpenAI push their chips all in. And GitHub just killed Vibe Coding. Greetings and welcome to IT Sparkcast News Bites. I'm your host, John Barger. And I'm your host, Lou Schmidt. Let's go see what's going on out there. It's Monday, September 15th. IT Sparkcast News Bites is a digest of the IT news over the last week with insights, opinions, and a little sarcasm from two experts, each with over 20 years of experience working in IT or for IT vendors. And now, the News Bites. <laughs> So I saw some grumbling about this one, John. Can you tell me what's going on with GitHub? Yeah, so this is interesting. So uh, GitHub has just recently released something called Spec Kit. So it's a set of tools and a paradigm, which I think will be a product manager's dream. And what, the reason I say that is that it's a new paradigm that's called Spec Driven Development. And uh, so if anybody's not familiar, GitHub is a code repository. It's a, a place that's uh, it's, it's owned by Microsoft. They bought it a bunch of years ago. They uh, it, it's part of their open source efforts. It's a, it's a really great tool for for, you know, source code management, for version control and so forth. And what spec driven development is, is it flips that traditional method of coding on its head where the specifications become the executable. You are directly producing the implementations rather than merely the guidelines. So uh, what you're doing is you're, you're defining the spec, you're defining the environments that are used, you're defining even the large language models that will be involved in building the code, and then allowing all the tools to work together to end up with an end result, as opposed to traditional vibe coding, traditional vibe coding, meaning like it's been around for a hundred years, right? But in, in what we've been known, known as vibe coding up till now is you sit down at your development tool of choice with an LLM, you start saying, build something that looks like this, and then you iterate on this. With, with this spec driven development, you really think more like a product manager. You build a full spec from, nut, from soup to nuts, you you design everything the the target environment the languages you want to write it in all these different pieces and then feed that into the tool set and and then build it out from there this actually seems like it's something really exciting and something that that I am going to start working on I actually have a couple of ideas for some some tools that I want to build and I'm going to look at this as my uh, my way of doing it um, this one just to me again seems like going from document to executable and honestly kind of bypassing a few uh, middlemen, if you will. So and that's why I, I keep calling it that product manager's dream. And, and for those of you that have been in the, in the development space, and, and I've, I've been in this space you know, on and off for, for a while, product managers come up with the product spec, they, they do the research of what does the market want, how should it work, all the different parameters. They build a, a large document. They provide that to engineering. Engineering builds it. In the traditional waterfall model, they build it and then QA takes it and starts testing it. In a more agile model, they start building pieces and, and a QA starts testing along the way. And then you start iterating on that. This seems to kind of bypass that whole process. You get a document and then you may iterate beyond that afterwards, but it, it really seems you know very interesting and really brings a lot of efficiency and control and reduces a lot of that manual handoff. You know what I think uh, we should do, John? I that? think we should come up with a simple idea for an application and record you doing it. This because idea, so yeah, because you what what you just what I just heard is that well, one thing was scary, one thing is even scarier. One Product managers can become direct coders. Now, those of us who've been involved with development know that product management creates a PRD, a product requirement stock, and product requirement stocks are often very nebulous. <laughs> um, and then engineering smacks them around and they meet in the middle. Um, okay, this isn't feasible. We can't exceed the speed of light. But this is, this, this is going to break down another wall. And I think this is going to change what it means to be a product manager. 
I do. I agree. And and so the the fight that happens between engineering and product uh, team often comes down to personality. Whereas this is, I think, going to actually create better product managers because a poorly defined spec is going to result in poor code. And you're going to see, you know, this turn into also a feedback engine of, well, if you ask me to do this, then that's going to create a massive problem. So you could almost QA it before it gets created. And so you can have a, a prediction engine, if you will, that says, you know, th this is the outcome that you've asked for. Do you really want that? And then kind of go back and forth and then and maybe iterate on the outcome that's desired and the method to get there. And I don't know. So I agree with you. I have a couple of ideas for a few different tools that might be helpful. Uh, I, I'm going to go start looking at the at the the tool itself and see what it can actually do, what, what the targets could be. Could it be an iPhone app or an Android app? Could it, is it only, you know, targeted towards more PC based uh, applications? We'll see. But what my ideas would would fit in either one. So we'll see what we can do. And, and I've got to say, this is another extension of something we've seen before. And the thing that we saw before, and I had this discussion with customers 15 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, when when the cloud was really getting going, was that one of the one of the developer uh, managers I talked to said, my uh, traditional development team would come to a meeting with a set of requirements, and my cloud team would come to a meeting with a with a demo, with with prototype code already running, and this changed a, completely how we went about doing some larger projects. Now we're seeing this come to a much lower level, uh, so. Folks, you're out there in IT, you should probably take a good solid look at this because maybe you can start building the stuff you need. Internet uh, tools will be, be a great uh, target for this. Wow. But Lou, why don't you take us from specs to SPACs? Specs to SPACs, indeed. <laughs> so this is an update for you folks who are keeping track of us from last season. We talked about these folks and uh, that is a company called Deep Vision. And what Deep Vision did this week is they went public via a reverse merger with a SPAC called Surfside Acquisitions, raising $30 million. So this is something that we saw a lot of earlier on in the AI space before valuations started jumping enough that folks didn't need to do this. Uh, so I consider this uh, some of uh, an encouraging sign. Some of these went really well, some of them crashed. Uh, via the, what, how we came out at the end of COVID. Uh, but they priced the shares at three bucks each. Uh, it's notably below the typical 10 bucks you've seen in similar deals. But these guys are up to is really interesting and very edgy. So Deep Vision is developed a 15 megawatt small modular reactor that can get in a 30 inch borehole. And you're like, well, okay, that sounds boring. I'd be like, yeah, okay, you're clever. But the whole idea is you drop this thing into a hole near your data center, probably, and you get power. You lower down about a mile where the pressure is the same as the operating pressure needs to be in a pressurized, small pressurized boiling water reactor, which means your containment is the geology around you. And the actual vessel itself doesn't have to be overbuilt because it's at the same pressure on the outside. So this is a very fascinating way to go about things. Um, the beauty of it is if something goes wrong, it's a mile below. <laughs> so, right. uh, and if you need more power, drill another hole. 30 inches is fairly standard technology for boreholes, apparently. Uh, so it's definitely doable. And we, we do stuff like this all the time. So the technology's out there. Uh, so it's really interesting to us to see this move into the next phase of capitalizing and, and maybe getting something out there. You know, so the other interesting part is the way they went public. And so we use the term SPAC. So SPAC is a special purpose acquisition company. And so what that is, is that basically there was a company that was already public and Deep Vision acquired that company and effectively became public by buying that company. And so it, it's a really interesting way to accomplish that without having to go through the process of going through an IPO. 
And so there's a lot of different reasons you might want to do that. And some of those might be that we just want to get there. And there's also other reasons that maybe are a little less like above board. You know, maybe there's, we don't want to go through the, 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 um, the data uh, exposure that's required, you know, what's going on on certain areas there. But that being said, I'm not suggesting that that's the case, but there are a number of different reasons, but it also is an expedient way to get there. It, it's a instant, effectively instant IPO. And, it's, and worth, it's worth noting one thing, my friend, and that is they have signed a deal with data center developer Endeavor for co-develop two gigawatts of underground nuclear capability. That's great. And they were chosen for the U.S. Department of Energy's reactor pilot program, which is yeah. going to streamline permitting. So I I think personally, they're trying to get on the momentum. So there's a lot of motion going on in, in the uh, small modular reactor space right now. Yeah. And things are starting to break loose. We're starting to see news of deployments and planned deployments and testing. And now they need to get ahead because there's a lot of good ideas out there. Um, yeah, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, we keep saying that that this is going to be the future, these small modular reactors or other forms of nuclear power. And the the thing, Sam Altman came out just like about a month ago and said that, that open AI and the other uh, AI vendors would be much farther ahead and you, and we would have much more powerful models if we had more available compute. And one of the things holding up compute right now is power, right? but it's that holding up the chips, it's holding up the, the data centers and it's the power. All of those things are required, but dude, I didn't even slip you a 20 and you gave me a perfect one. There you go. So uh, when it comes to chips, OpenAI has announced that they are launching their first AI chip uh, with Broadcom and they will be shipping those in 2026. That's fast. so that is fast. So uh, they're, so Broadcom is one of the leading chipset manufacturers out there. They um, they have not yet started working in the artificial intelligence chip space yet. That's really been largely on NVIDIA's side and some of the other uh, chip manufacturers have uh, applied AI into their existing chipsets, but now Broadcom is stepping into it directly hand in hand with open AI. And they're again, expecting mass uh, production in 2026. And it's going to be designed specifically for use by OpenAI's uh, data centers and will not be made available to external customers uh, for any known period of time. Do you actually believe that? For the, for, for the foreseeable future, yeah. I think that OpenAI's growth, especially through things like uh, Project Stargate, is going to you know be a huge drain on whatever their capacity is. So yeah, I would say that for quite a while, that, that yeah, if they say that, that's probably absolutely true. Actually, you're probably right because I just I just upgraded my phone. I have a Google Pixel 10 Pro XL, whatever, all that good stuff. Uh, the Tensor chip in that is custom and was uh, taped out by TSMC. We've seen Tesla, uh, they're, they're hitting tape out on AI5 uh, and with TSMC and they're already bought the entire output of Samsung's Texas Fab. Well, that, you know, so that's an interesting AI point. That you, yeah, so that's an interesting point you're making there is that we're, we, we just said in the previous news segment that that it's the hardware that's gating the 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 evolution of AI, and the reality is is that the the push forward in hardware and chips is really gated on two companies right now. It's NVIDIA and TSMC, right? Yeah. No, it, the, nobody else is a player. Uh, um, so, I mean, everybody else is using them. Uh, and TSMC is the major manufacturer out there. And, and Intel's trying to come back and they're not, you know, they haven't been a, a player for a while in that space. So we're seeing uh, Tesla has announced that when it comes to their robotics, they're building everything in-house. The, yeah, the so AI everything. chip that I was talking about yeah. is going to be for the cars, the robots, rockets they've got to send up. I wouldn't be shocked to see those chips on Starlinks. Yeah, but it's everything there. So that this is going to be a new trend is because the industry is effectively, the manufacturing of, of chips has become saturated and log jammed, you're going to see more and more people start, or more and more companies start making their own chips or partnering in the way that OpenAI and Broadcom are doing. So that's going to get really interesting as that happens. Oh, yeah. So we'll, and we're going to, we'll definitely keep you up to speed on this, but 
you know, it, this whole thing started with custom chips, with Google doing their Tensor accelerators. Then it sort of exploded sideways somewhere else. And now it looks like it's coming back to custom built chips for, I mean, if you're going to outfit 10 data centers with it, you're probably better off building your own chip. And now you can. So I, I, we're watching this closely. We'll keep you up to date on what we see happening. This is absolutely not the last bit of news that we're going to see here. I'm quite it's certain not. there's a lot more going on. But that is going to cover this episode. And we couldn't do this podcast without listeners like you. We would love to hear what you think. Do you have another topic you want us to cover? Do you have thoughts on previous topics that we just discussed? Send email to feedback at itsparkcast.com. Hit us up on X at itsparkcast. Or if you're on YouTube, leave a comment down below. We read every single bit of feedback in every comment that we get, and we respond to most. And if it's particularly insightful, we'll read it out on our broadcast. Uh, make sure you hit like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. That way you never miss an episode. And with that, from the world of enterprise IT, take care. Thanks for spending some time with us. We'll see you next week. 